Hi friends, this is Dr. Ralph Wilson with the Jesus Walk Bible Study Series. We're studying Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is Lesson 2, The Lamb Who Took Our Place. And we're looking particularly today at Isaiah chapter 53. It's a fairly long passage. It starts in Isaiah 52, 13 and runs through verse 12 of Isaiah 53. So I encourage you to stop the DVD at this point and read the entire passage in your group. Then start the DVD again and let's see how it applies to Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Pause the DVD now. Let's pray together as we begin. Father, thank you so much for your word. And we ask you that as we study, that you would bring clarity to us to, to understand what you've done for us as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. In Acts chapter 8, Philip the Evangelist is on the road to Gaza when the Spirit of God directs him to a chariot containing the treasurer of Ethiopia, reading and trying to make sense out of Isaiah chapter 53, verses 7 and 8 that you just read. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before the shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. And the treasurer of Ethiopia asks Philip, Who is the prophet talking about? Luke records, Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus, the true Lamb of God. This week's lesson will be examining the profound ways in which Isaiah 53 speaks about Jesus' own ministry and mission. Well, when John the Baptist cries out, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, we wonder just which lamb in the Bible is he referring to? Is he thinking of this lamb led to the slaughter in Isaiah 53? Very likely. The suffering servant figure of the lamb in Isaiah 53 deals with sin on a universal basis, the sin of the nations, the sin of the whole world. Isaiah 53 is one of a series of several passages in Isaiah 40 to 55, and perhaps as far as Isaiah 60, that are referred to as the servant songs, because they present the servant of the Lord, the servant of Yahweh, or the suffering servant, who has a special mission. Notice the scope of the servant's ministry in Isaiah 52, 13 to chapter 53, verse 12. He will sprinkle many nations, laid on him the iniquity of us all, the transgression of my people. He will justify many. He bore the sin of many. In verse 8, the prophet focuses on the sins of the Jewish nation. But the servant's role is broader. It clearly extends to many nations. The servant, depicted as a lamb in verse 7, actually takes away the sin of the world. In a moment, we'll pause for discussion question one. But uh, in your answers to these week, this week's questions, please don't just parrot your Sunday school knowledge and Bible verses, but take time to dig into this text deeply and see what it says for itself. You'll be richer for it. Okay, here's discussion question one. You know the drill. We'll give the question, you pause the DVD, and then when you're done, we move on. Here's the question. From how large a group of people does God remove sins in Isaiah 53? In what sense is this a universal sacrifice of salvation? In what sense is Jesus' sacrifice wasted on some people. Okay, pause your DVD now and then resume when you finish discussing. When you look at all the New Testament passages that quote or have clear allusions to Isaiah 53, 
you can see that this passage has been extremely influential in the way that the apostles understood Jesus' death. It's also pretty clear that this passage was at the core of how Jesus understood his own mission. Let me offer a couple of examples that prove my point. Mark 10, 45, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Now, this isn't a direct quotation of Isaiah 53, but a conceptual parallel. Four ideas indicate that Isaiah 53 is the primary source of Jesus' teaching here. One, the servanthood. Two, the atoning death. Three, the idea of voluntarily giving one's life. And four, the wording, for many, which parallels the words many and of many in verses 11 and 12 of Isaiah 53. In Jesus' words at the Last Supper, this for many phrase is also repeated, Matthew 26, 28. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus in Mark 9, 12 says, Why then is it written that the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected? That's a pretty clear reference to Isaiah 53, 3 to his companions on the road to Emmaus after his resurrection, Jesus begins, and this is Luke 24, 25 to 27. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Jesus quoted Isaiah 53, 12 himself in Luke 22, 37. It is written, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And I tell you that this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written about me is reaching fulfillment. Jesus obviously knew Isaiah 53 well and was convinced that they spoke about his own mission and destiny. Well, we've come to discussion question two. Which New Testament parallels to Isaiah 53 convince you that Jesus himself saw his own mission and destiny spelled out in Isaiah 53? And if you aren't convinced, what stands in your way? Okay, pause the DVD now and discuss this. Isaiah 53 is a complex passage. My approach here won't be a verse-by-verse -verse commentary, but a kind of topical study of five themes which relate to Jesus' work of atonement. Number one, the servant is a substitute who bears our sin. The first clear theme on atonement is that the servant, or lamb in our analogy, is a substitute for us. That is, he bears our sins instead of us. Consider these verses. Verse 4, Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Verse 5, He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Verse 6, The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Verse 10, The Lord makes his life a guilt offering. Verse 11, He will bear their iniquities. Verse 12, For he bore the sin of many. <laughs> the risk of being too technical, I'd like to dip into the original Hebrew to see exactly what is meant. In verse 10, we find the Hebrew noun is ashem, which means offering for sin. Sin, trespass offering. With few exceptions, this noun denotes the trespass offering or guilt offering offered in the tabernacle and later in the temple and occurs 22 times in Leviticus. In several of these instances, a lamb is the guilt offering. Clearly, the servant, the lamb in Isaiah 53, is seen as a trespass offering, but one who takes the sin not of just a few, but of all. Now let's look at three key verbs, each repeated twice within the larger passage. Nasa, lift, carry, take. The term is used literally, as well as figuratively, of bearing the guilt or punishment of sin. The word is used of the scapegoat, 
bearing Israel's sins into the wilderness on the Day of Atonement, Leviticus 16.22. Nasa can also imply the taking away forgiveness or pardon of sin, iniquity, and transgression. The second verb is sabal. The primary meaning is bear, transport, such as a heavy load. In Isaiah 53, it puts the stress of bearing the weight of man's sickness, sorrow, sin, and punishment. I wonder how heavy this load of sin felt when it settled in on Jesus. And then the word paga in chapter 53 means to lay, to burden. So the servant lamb in this passage carries or bears the heavy load of sin as would a sacrifice. But it is our sin, the sin of us all, that is laid upon him. In lesson one, we studied the idea of transfer from the sinner to the sacrifice by means of the laying on of hands. The sin is understood to pass from the sinner to the sacrifice, which then carries the sins. There is a strong parallel to Isaiah 53, found in the Apostle Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 5, verse 21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You must admit, it's a pretty awe-inspiring concept that our sins transfer to him and his righteousness to us. Another New Testament passage, this time from Peter, is in some ways a paraphrase of Isaiah 53 that clearly points out the atoning work of Christ, 1 Peter 2, 24-25. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Now he quotes verse Isaiah 53, 9. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. And, then quoting Isaiah 53, 5, By his wounds you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Notice the phrase, by his wounds you have been healed. This moves us on to our second theme, and that is, the servant is a substitute who bears our punishment. See, my first point is that he bears the sins of the people. But the servant in Isaiah also bears their punishment, standing in as a substitute in their place. Notice the verbs that indicate the punishment he undergoes for both God and man. Verse 4, we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. Verse 7, he was oppressed and afflicted. Verse 10, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. Two verses bring out especially clearly the idea that he bears punishment on our behalf, the servant, in exchange for sinners. Verse 5, But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. And verse 8, for the transgression of my people he was stricken. We have sinned and deserve punishment, but we cannot stand the punishment we deserve. So the servant lamb steps in to take our punishment. He takes it and takes it until it kills him on our behalf. Well, you and I have questions on how this could happen. Is it fair? How can one person be allowed to take another's sin and punishment? You can find some of the answers in the Old Testament ideas of leaders who represent nations, Adam who represents the human race, etc. 
Theologians sometimes call this concept federal headship and have argued about it for centuries. But whether or not we can quite understand it, Isaiah 53 is pretty clear that the servant lamb does indeed take our sin and punishment upon him. And the New Testament is unanimous that because of this, we are forgiven. Well, let's pause here for discussion question three. Isaiah 53 teaches what theologians call the substitutionary atonement. In what sense does the servant act as a substitute to bear our sins? Put this in your own words. And then before you resume again, uh, discussion question four, in addition to our sins, the servant also bears the punishment deserved by sinners. In what sense, if any, did Jesus bear the punishment due you when he died on the cross? Okay, pause the DVD now and, and work on discuss, discussion questions three and four, and then start the DVD again. Well, the third point I want you to see in Isaiah 53 is that the servant acts willingly, voluntarily. He is not a victim, but a willing participant. The prophecy makes that clear in several ways. Notice the active verbs showing the action of the servant. Verse 12, he poured out his life to death. Verse 4, surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Verse 7, he did not open his mouth. An unwilling victim would cry out and complain. Jesus did neither, but was silent before his judges and executioners. He poured out his soul or life unto death. He carried our infirmities and sorrows because he wanted to. Now consider a fourth theme the servant acts as a priest. In most of the references in this passage, the servant is a sacrifice who bears the sin and punishment to us, but in two rather remarkable verses, he also appears to act as would a priest. First, Isaiah 52, 15, so he will sprinkle many nations. In the tabernacle and temple, the priest would sprinkle the blood either with his finger or with a sprinkling tool. Here the servant is said to sprinkle in order to cleanse the sins of many nations. The paradox of this passage is that though the disfigured servant is seen by others as unclean, yet he is the one who is offering cleansing to the nations, as would a priest. The second priestly passage is in chapter 53, verse 11, by his knowledge my righteous servant will justify many. The upright priest will make sinners righteous by his sacrifices of atonement, but the righteous servant who has borne sin now acts as a priest to justify others. The Hebrew word means declare righteous, justify. Here is the Old Testament basis of Paul's insight into justification by faith outlined in Romans 3, especially verses 24 to 26. In Isaiah 53, we see the servant lamb as the one who justifies. In the New Testament, justifying sinners is clearly a divine act. A final and fifth theme in Isaiah 53 is God's exaltation of his righteous servant. Consider these verses, uh, 52, 13. He will be raised up and lifted up and highly exalted. 53, 12. Therefore, I will give him a portion with the great. In Philippians 2, 9 through 11, Paul echoes this theme. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The servant in Isaiah 53 is vindicated and exalted publicly. 
As I studied Isaiah 53, I was amazed to find that this exaltation seems to include resurrection from the dead. Look at verse 11. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. The phrase light of life in the New International Version doesn't occur in the Masoretic Hebrew text, but is found in both the Greek Septuagint translation as well as the Hebrew text of the Isaiah scroll found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. The servant's contemporaries saw him cut off from the land of the living, verse 8. But verse 12 indicates that the servant will see light, that is, life, outside the grave, even after his atoning death. I expect that Jesus also saw this promise, which underlies his teaching to his disciples that it is written that the Son of Man would be raised from the dead. Discussion question 5. Which single New Testament passage best sums up for you the lessons of Isaiah 53, and why did you choose this passage? So here are several passages that uh, you can read together and then decide for, for yourself which is the, the one that says it for you. And I give you a list from Matthew, Luke, John, Romans, etc. Or any other passage you can think of. Stop the DVD now and discuss this and then start it again when you're ready. After this survey of five themes in Isaiah 53, you can see why the concepts in this passage lie at the root of much of the Christian understanding of atonement. The servant lamb in Isaiah 53, 1, bears our sin as a substitutionary atonement. 2, receives the punishment due us on account of our sin. 3, acts voluntarily as a sacrifice for us. 4, performs the cleansing and justifying roles of a priest, and five, is finally exalted and vindicated by God in resurrection from the dead. Who is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world? Jesus. Have you asked him to take away your sin? Let's pray together. Father, as I have studied Isaiah 53, I must say I am awed. I've read this before, but I guess I've never really appreciated all Jesus did on my behalf as a sacrifice, as a lamb, as a servant. Thank you, Father, for your love that prompted this amazing and ultimate act of love. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Before I conclude, let me address you personally. If you're not sure that you've ever really put your trust in Jesus before, why don't you do it right now? No matter what your religious background or lack of religious background, formulate a simple prayer to God and speak it out loud. Tell God that you believe in Jesus, that you have sinned, that you ask for forgiveness and cleansing, that you believe that Jesus was sacrificed for all your sins, that you'll seek to follow Jesus for the rest of your life, and then conclude your prayer with thanks for God's great gift to you. May God richly bless you as you serve Jesus Christ the Lord, the Lamb of God. Amen.